Abai Mugulutai. She's talking about Gulutan. She's talking about FGM, female genital mutilation. But um, do I tell my husband? Of course. You have to. You. She has to tell Are him. you dumb? Don't tell him. He's just gonna use it against you. Really? Listen, he won't even notice he's gone. What would you do? And welcome back to the Sheko Sheko After Show. We hope you guys liked episode two of A Yan's World. Today we have a special guest on, Dr. Leila Hussein. And Dr. Leila Hussein is a Somali-born British psychotherapist and activist. She is the founder of Dahlia Projects. She is also the deputy lead in an African-led movement to end FGM. You guys can find Dr. Leila Hussein on YouTube from her Channel 4 documentary to her TED Talk. I've realized that my own family have never got together for a frank discussion on FGM. I've convinced my mom to sit down with me, my brother and my sister. My mum has asked me to disguise her face because she's worried about the response from our own community. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Hi, thank you for having me today. Thank you for coming on and being our first guest on the Sheko Sheko After Show. We really appreciate it. Have you been? How's everything in London? London, it's very damp and rainy and cold and it's, yeah, there might be, there might be another lockdown. So there's a bit of a, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a tough year, let's just yeah, say. Yeah, it's been a tough yeah. year for everybody. Inshallah, we'll get past it. We'll get through it. So the reason why we had you on today is that um, on our episode of A Young's World, we, we tackled FGM, female genital mutilation. Um, and we touch upon it and we wanted to educate ourselves, me and our audience. And we thought that the best person to have on to discuss this would be you since you've been an activist, since you've been fighting this fight for a long time. Uh, and if you could just tell us a little about, about yourself and your journey. And yeah. I mean, so I, I got involved in this work. It was what you would call the accidental activist. I didn't even know I was an activist until a journalist pointed out to me. You know, I grew up in the West most of my life, since my childhood. I grew up between uh, Italy. My dad had a, uh, was an engineer, worked for an Italian company. So most of my childhood was in Italy, a little bit in Saudi Arabia, but majority Italy. Only a little bit I stayed in Somalia. And that's when I un underwent the practice myself. Um, but then by the time I was 10, I left again. So I was in the West from the age of 10. I'm going to be 40 in a couple of days, by the way. <laughs> and the reason I tell that bit of the story, I think sometimes those who are not Somali or others have this assumption that FGM happens to people who are, you know, still live back home, uh, who might never be into school. You know, there's that assumption. You know, I come from two educated parents. My dad's side, was, they were all academics. My mom's side were all, doc you know, doctors. So I want people to understand that FGM had nothing to do with your social economical status. Yeah. This is something that everybody had to undergo. Anyway, to cut that long story short, we moved to the UK at the age of 18. At the age of 18, I got married uh, against my parents' will, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> and at 21, I uh, get pregnant. Uh, I have my daughter. It was a horrible pregnancy. It was a terrible birth, but no one asked anything. No one person in the hospital even questioned why this might be the case. And, oh, wow. uh, and when my daughter was two months old, uh, I went to, so yeah, you know, you go through like these jabs that you have to have. So any one of the nurses that I yeah. come across asks me, she goes, Ms. Hussein, what was your pregnancy like? And I said, oh my God, it was terrible. It was horrible. I'm, I'm not going to have a baby again. Oh, by the way, I never haven't done the baby again. I was seriously <laughs> traumatized by the whole experience. Wow. She was the first person when I told her, you know, I pass out every time I'm examined. She was like, oh, okay. She goes, can I just check? You know, on your record, it says you're from Somalia, you know. I know in Somalia they practice something called female genital mutilation. Have you had this done? My response was, of course I did, but I didn't have the worst type. There's different so types. I, there's different types. So there's type one, which is like pricking of the clitoris. Type two, pricking of the clitoris, maybe a little bit of a cut and a stitch. Type three, which is called the 
infibulation, which is the worst type, is the one that Somalia is mainly in practice, where they remove the large labia, the small labia, the clitoris is also removed, and the remaining skin is pulled together, literally wow. stitched from top to bottom and left with a tiny little hole. Wow. So my was like, oh no, I didn't have uh, the worst type, you know, I was fine. I didn't have problem urinating and all the other stuff like uh, people are suffering with. So I took that like, if it's not a big deal. She took it, my God, this is an alarm bell. She has a daughter, she might do it to her. I, but the nurse was brilliant. She really took the time to educate me. So for me, that was really early on, something that I had to always take on to every space that I go to. Mm -hmm. Educating people was important, but also what I learned quite early on that the UK education system was a mess because the, the education system did not teach me about my own body as a woman. Yes. So it's easy to blame communities on this. Mm -hmm. The so-called West who constantly blames the community, the West themselves don't teach girls about their bodies. So for me, maybe different ways of oppressing girls, but the same message behind it is like both sides telling girls, you know, we, we didn't need to know that. So for me, I guess I got involved in this work and my mom would tell my mom would tell from a very young age I was always a very curious child I always wanted to know why and I had parents who encouraged me to always ask questions so I started asking questions yes. why wasn't this given to me why didn't the midwife ask me I mean she could clearly see her scar you know what literally it was out of anger and frustration uh, then I thought how many women uh, young moms like me are out there mm -hmm. so I ended up volunteering for the clinic um, for a couple of years, then ended up becoming a youth outreach worker. And then through there, I decided tr to train. Uh, for me, grassroots work was always the heart of everything. Like that's, mm -hmm. I'm always in my community. So I ended up training as a psychotherapist for I mean, good four years, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm, a, I'm a single parent, by the way, while, while all this is happening. If it wasn't, my God, for my family, I, would, I don't think, I would, but it was, you know, I would sit down and study 10 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> it was like, yeah. that's the only time I can study because I'll put the chair now. Um, so, and, and, but through that process, I really wanted to set up a specialist clinic. You know, I've been going to different, because when you're training, you have to be therapy yourself. Yeah. Point presentation to the therapist about what FGM is. Yes. That really took away a lot of our time. So I wanted to create a service where the women could come, but not explain what FGM is. But also I wanted the women... So, so this is where Dali was for, but Dali was not just to give women the space to learn about FGM. I wanted them to learn why FGM happens. So people always say to me, oh, Leila Hussein, she's fighting FGM. No, my biggest fight is actually fighting a, a patriarchal system that controls women. And the patriarchal system, it's everywhere. Everywhere. It's royal family in the UK. I think they're, they're the Canadians royal family too. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> like if you, if you listen to the newspapers, Read the newspapers. There are many articles about Kate's, Kate Williams' skirt or how mm -hmm. Meghan Markle behaves. Why is that any different to the way we get treated in our own communities? So it's for me, I'm trying, so I've been trying to bring both of these conversations. It's difficult at times because the media sometimes will betray as if, oh my gosh, she's only talking about Somalis. No, it's, we need to bring these two conversations because in, in order to end FGM, you have to tackle the patriarchal system that allows it to happen. So that's always been my work. That's what I've been teaching at universities. We need to understand, actually, in order to end all forms, all forms of violence and oppression against women, we have to go to the root of the problem, which is a patriarchal system which is embedded in our social status. It's embedded in our political space. So the fight is not FGM. The fight is the system that allows it to happen. So that really has been my fight most of the time. Like, um, so that's really a little background. And I, uh, a year ago, uh, nearly two years ago, I set up my own company called Magal. Magal obviously yeah. is a famous Somali name. I, I, even though my daughter's called Fairuz, I named my daughter Fairuz, but I, somewhere when she was two, I became the woke black woman. And I was like, wait a minute, why do we have Arabic names? I asked oh, myself a question. Oh, 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 yeah. Wait a minute, what happened to the Somali name? Like I became a nationalist all of a sudden. So right. I searched for these names. And Magal, I really loved. Uh, it means early flowering. Early flowering. Early, early flowering. And it's when you water it, nurture it, nurture it, it becomes what it needs to be. Like, that's what mm. Magal is. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And, and I, then I found out one of my favorite smile singers, you know, 
was also called Magana, and I found out her, her history that she was once exiled yeah. from the country. Yeah, so I like, massive, and I like women are troublemakers. They're, they're, they're <laughs> my favorite. So it was, uh, so Magal became my company where I developed emotional well being tools and resources for companies, organizations. Mm -hmm. So I worked with WHO, the UN, developing a lot of their well-being tools and other, other organizations. So that was, uh, and um, now I teach at different universities. Um, I've been very lucky because of my position. I, and, I, and I worked on a particular unique work, not, not necessarily FGM. I look at systems. That's what I really I am interested in. And I've been lucky to be a guest lecturer, you know, all the Ivy League universities in the US and the UK. And currently being elected as the director of the University of St Andrews, which is one of the, you know, prestige. Yeah. So that's really a little bit about me. About my, you. Yeah, but I'm currently going to be working in Africa too. So for me, it's going back there, and I've been I've been yeah. going back for the last few years. No. Um, quite quite the resume you got. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> the Dahlia projects. What services do they offer? This counseling service. So we offer emotional, psychological support or psychosexual support for the women because this is a space where the women come and for the first time they're going to talk about FGM not in a cultural, religious uh, perspective. It's recognizing it that it's actually abuse that they experience. So this will be the first time where they're finally going to really go on that journey and acknowledge what happened to them and the damage, the physical damage. The physical damage means there's psychological damage too. Mm -hmm. um, so we create, so we run support groups, we run one-to-one -one sessions, but we also bring other agencies to our space. For example, we have other alternative therapies. If there's an art therapy, cooking therapy, uh, yoga, meditation. I mean, we have Somali women, believe it or not, who absolutely fell in love with yoga. It's a trendy exercise program in an unlikely place. In classes across the Somali capital Mogadishu, youth practice breathing, meditation, and stretching. But it's not just for fun. This mind-body wellness program, as it's called here, is for survivors of sexual violence and other trauma to help them with the counseling they receive. In the beginning, I had anxiety. Now I'm better. I couldn't eat. Now I can eat. I don't have problems. It helped me reduce my anxiety and the worries. Each time the memory comes back to me, I do the exercise and it helps me forget. Besides survivors of sexual violence, there are former child soldiers and other youth suffering from trauma. I really found yoga meditation so extremely helpful with anxiety. Wow. So they've, they've gone off further actually joining yoga meditation groups outside of our clinic. So for me, it's, it's not just the therapy the women are coming for. They're really learning how to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have gone into higher education. A lot of them have left very violent uh, relationships. Uh, so it's not, it hasn't just made a better life for them, but it's made a better life for their family, for their kids. You know, some of them have, you know, uh, I mean, some have violent partners, but some of them have amazing husbands and partners who really are interactive in making sure they come to, like I have, you know, loads of women whose husbands drive them to the, you know, yes, their yes. Actually, we're currently going to be starting a support group for men because we know we feel the men also yes. need, because it's, it's, it's a very difficult, um, uh, you know, it, we're all learning. So I'm learning how to be, I'm learning about my body and what, what it's like to be a woman. I'm, I'm, and I think, I think men were, were, were once young boys who were given the wrong information. So yes. we're trying to create space now where we bring men so they can unlearn and unlearn a lot of those behaviors. Mm -hmm. That is very damaging because, you know, when women are free and happy, it, it, it has an impact on everybody. Do you see what I mean? So, everybody benefits from it and i think i think and i think actually what's been great a lot of the men whose wives have been coming you know or partners who have been coming to these sessions could see the change you know and really and they're sharing it with other men oh yeah by the way my wife is so much nicer and uh, calmer and uh, she really you know has boundaries and and it's like word by mouth somebody says, hey you should go to this <laughs> clinic you know <laughs> <laughs> But we want to create, for, for us, is that we really take, 
me a holistic approach. I mean, every project I worked on, a holistic approach is important. We have to really listen to people. And, and, and for me, any project I worked on is not my idea and this is what works. I, I take a co-creation phase. There's a co-creation phase we go through. We're co-creating it together. Like our clinic, Dahlia, has changed every year because oh. we meet with the women once a year to discuss what worked, what hasn't worked. And, and really we take that on board. Like we had one that said like early on, you know, not many women are gonna come to this building. How mm. do we go to the women? So we, we became an outreach counseling service. Uh. So we would go and partner with the school. So all the moms who come to the school drop off their kids, they drop the kids off, they just go to the other room. There's a therapy session. So we worked with the school to give us the space. Mm -hmm. But that feedback came from, from the service users. So it's really important when you're, you know, um, I mean, with my projects as a, as a social entrepreneur, it's always looking at the needs of those who I'm trying to create a service for. That's absolutely key to me. Like I have to be in contact. Like when I created an emotional wellbeing tool for activists in Kenya, mm -hmm. they were part of the whole process because I don't live in Kenya in a village. So I can't tell them yeah. what works. But what I could do is maybe start the process on how we can make a better tool for them. So we're going back and forth, back and forth, we're testing things out. So Dahlia, really, it's, I mean, it's now considered one of the, by the UK government, they consider it a best practice of um, a clinic that deals with specific harmful practice. And uh, we are now working, so we were a community clinic. Um, last year, the UK government gave us a little bit of funding. We're now in two hospitals. We're in maternity wards. So we, it's slowly growing, which slowly. is great. Yeah, this is start. Yeah, this is yeah, the start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the start of something, right? I mean, to right? be honest, I'm hardly involved in it now because I have a whole team running it, which I'm very proud of. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I was there when it, but yes. it was, I was by myself. Literally, I was my own yes. admin. I was my own clinician. I was my own assessor. I was my own everything. Like, and now I have a brilliant team running it. Like you said, you're, you're a grassroots activist starter, right? So you, Absolutely. you are on the ground getting it up. And that's, and that's what I, you know, I love that mm. dedication. Love that dedication. Absolutely. We have a couple of questions from our audience that we could just go right through them. First one is, um, in your opinion, should a wife tell her husband if she had the procedure? I think any woman who's in any relationship, in an intimate relationship with somebody, she has to. It, it's a must, but it's how you have the conversation is very important. And who you're having the conversation is very important. So you have to make sure this is someone who's very, if someone really cares about you and it's respectful, they'll understand. But what the partner, so if you're a man listening to this, just be mindful that just because a woman has undergone FGM, that doesn't mean she can't still be intimate and enjoy being intimate with you. So I think that, I think there's a perception that women who, yeah. who've undergone FGM don't enjoy intimacy. They absolutely do. Physical intimacy, it's more psychological than it is physical. So that's very mm -hmm. important. And that also plays in a role with both. So both being comfortable with each other. So I think it's important if this means, if this person means a lot to you, it's important that they know. Because, you know, uh, FGM, it, it doesn't just, it has an impact to you throughout your life, you know, like during your menstrual cycle, you're in pain. Yeah. So your partner needs to know why you're suffering, you know, why this is happening to you. I think it's important that they, they know that. But I, I guess have it in a safe environment is important. If this person means a lot to you, they, it's, it's important that they know about this. But it's how you have the conversations. What is your advice to Somali boys and men uh, B, when they marry a woman with FGM? I would say if you're a man who is with a woman or pursuing a woman who's undergone FGM, one, I would say, listen, I think you can ask at some point in that conversation, say, hey, can I just check? By the way, you just check in. You know, but, but then you have to have a bit of a relationship. You don't ask on your first date, by the way. Yeah, so that's no. very <laughs> you don't say, hey, I, by the way, you know, no, don't do that. <laughs> you have to build a bit of a rapport and, a, you know, and say, you know, listen, I, and, and, and uh, uh, the Somali guys have the entrance point of saying, this is something that my mother has been through, my aunties, because that is literally fundamentally what's happened. And I just want to check that, you know, have you gone through this? And if you have, you know, are there support or help? Maybe, you know, we can look together and see and check that you can get this. If you know, did you know there's support for you out there? So make sure you have information with you 
like get some leaflets before you have this conversation. You can pull it out when she tells you she has. Oh, by the way, did you know you can get help? I can take you there. So you need, so you need to be very supportive because if she discloses, she, you might be the first ever human being she tells. So that's a big deal. Mm. So be, 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 be ready for that. And again, it's really how you say it, but be informed. Get your information first. Don't just ask. Mm-hmm. Make sure you have a leaflet. Find for a, a local organization because once you open that box, it's hard to close it back again. So you need to make sure she has some support. And actually, you know, to all men out there, a lot of women would appreciate if you ask that question. Oh, okay. really would, yeah, because I think a lot of women are worried constantly. Like there's an anxiety. There's a especially with the younger generation. My generation is different because my my generation of met Somali men only knew girls who were cut but now there's a younger generation of my brother's age like in his, who's in his like 20s who to him that's like what girls are the parts are t- being taken away like mm-hmm. i'm like yeah that's if you date a smile again more likely than that has happened and it's important that you know we we were being stigmatized for not being cut and I don't want the next generation boys to t- stigmatize those girls and I just because they were cut. So we have to be really careful. Um, it, it, just because she's had it, that doesn't mean she would be any less desirable or be intimate. Again, it depends on the two people and the relationship they have. Intimacy is more psychological. It's about physical touch and you know how you look at somebody. And, and it, by the way, those are things you have to go and learn, both of you together. It's a chance to go and learn. I would say that to everyone, go and learn about what, is, what does intimacy mean? Maybe that's the next uh, subject for your podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's, a lot of people genuinely don't know what it's that true. means. It's true, especially in our we community. Have, especially in our community, no, we don't. Where did the practice originate from? Mm. And why is it more emphasized in Somali women compared mm-hmm. to other places in the world? Good question. So what is it? What, what's the word you hear when you talk about FGM? Uh, the pharaonic circumcision so it go it's it stems from the pharaonic times this is why i never understood why somalis practice this uh, bio practice this is a pharaonic practice so if we are a muslim society right in mm. somalis are mainly muslims right why are we practicing something the pharaohs clearly said it was their practice uh. right so the argument has always been one is nothing to do with religion i know they use religion as an ex- as a reason because if it was practice in religion, we would have heard uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his, his wife would have had it done, his daughter would have it done. That would have been, been very, made very clear. And in Islam clearly says, you cannot change how God made you. I mean, this piercing her ears is still like up for questioning. You know, that's still like being debated. Yes. We're allowed to pierce our, ear, our ear, earrings. So why are we taking away female organs? Mm-hmm. And actually, if you read early texts, you know, the, the Quran text has changed over the years. If you read the early Quran text, um, really, if you go and research, there's really good ones. You will see there was actually a lot of text around female sexuality. You know, Islam mm. uh, uh, actually celebrated all of this. So there is a so we've taken on this pharaonic practice. But why Somalis practiced it for so long? Culturally. So it's not, it's not religion anymore. It's not religion. Culturally, we have a patriarchal system. Women needed to be controlled. So this was one of the ways of ensuring that, to make sure a woman behaves, because that's where the pharaohs were, the pharaohs were doing it. Because when they went to wars, they didn't want the woman uh, sleeping around or being with other people. So we, we stitch her up. So this was, and I think some, at some point, the Somalis really need to come to, you know, we need to start recognizing that. Mm-hmm. Maybe originally that's not why it started, but now that's where we got to. It really is like the amount of times when you hit, when I ask people, why do you do it? It's to say, so the girls can behave properly. So this idea that we are going to be, unbeha- you know, we're going to behave badly yeah. um, if this doesn't happen. Listen, if a woman chooses to go and be, have sex or intimate with somebody else, it's been happening. It's happened so many times. It's never changed. <laughs> You know, that's always been the case. That's a personal choice. But the idea of torturing children, and we have to think about, this happens to children. You know, I was seven when this happened to me. You know, a seven-year-old to undergo such a thing, I mean, it really is extremely damaging. So Somalis, 
it, the conversation is not about religion. It's why we need to talk about why we have a culture that feels the need to control the female body. That's really that's been the big, big, big issue. There was a second part to your question. Which... Why is it much more emphasized in Somali women? Yes. So I tell you why. The the the, the uh, so the anti FGM campaign originally originally started in Kenya. Kenya really is one of the leading countries of where they're really getting somewhere in trying to end FGM. And there's a reason why, because that campaigning started in the 1930s, like they were fighting it. Wow, 1930s. But, right. But they in Somalia in the 60s, we had a big women's movement that we don't talk about. It's so weird. Somalis, we're like, we're seen as this like, this society that women have been silent. My grandmother was one of those women who was marching in the middle of Mogadishu. Okay. So there was a big, they didn't call it feminist, but it really, they were considered the feminist movement. In today's world, they would have been the feminist movement who really wanted women to have rights. So FGM was one of the first things they tackled because not, we were 99%. Girls were dying left, right, and center. Like they were getting something called fistula where your vagina will break and you can't hold your urine or feces. So girls were being like thrown out in their homes. Wow. This was becoming a pandemic around that time. Mm -hmm. So a big movement happened that the the West media picked up on. The West media picked up on it, and uh, and 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 we were, I mean, listen, the I'm always correcting people on yes, you know, we have one of the highest numbers. However, the reason Somali women are the are always featured in this space is because we were brave enough to come forward when mm -hmm. no one else was. We were the okay. bravest. So Somali women need to be given, you know, credit for that. You know, yes. you know, the word is Iman, all those women, you know, so mm -hmm. many came forward. They need to be, they, they, they called out something that I remember Ban Ki-moon, you know, when he was the head of the UN said, you know, if it, if it wasn't for Somali women, FGM would not be on the agenda. It yeah. wouldn't be on the agenda. Um, so Somali women need to be credited. Yes, the media puts us in that position all the time. And I'm, but what I do, I guess, when I'm in front of the media, I'm, I have to educate them, you know, is practiced, you know, by all these countries. You know, whenever I mention, you know, FGM happens in Colombia or yeah. Russia or yeah. Jordan, you know, in Dubai, no matter, you know, it's all. So when I'm in that position, I'm going to be sitting there to teach everybody. It's practiced amongst Christians, Muslims. Uh, the Jewish Ethiopians practice it, non-believers practice it. So it has nothing to do with religion. Gotcha. But Somalis, historically, we were leading the campaign. I mean, if you go, there's a really great documentary made in 1988, you know, where the Somali president at the time committed to, it was called the Millennium Campaign. So by 2000, there'll be no, there'll be no FGM in Somalia. Wahal loo gaaday in dhaqamada gaboobaysida gudniinka uu yahay mid aad ku reebta caafimaadka dumarka mid jireed iyo dhimireedba waxa yeelay wuxuu sababi karaa qofkii oo geeriyooda mise hadal reebta argagax awgiis maxay yihiin dhibaatooyinka gudniinka uu ku reebto dumarka si gaar ahaan midka laga isticmaalo Soomaaliya oo loo yaqaan gudniinka tolan but obviously the civil war happened that interrupted the whole campaign. Oh. So we were really at the forefront. Like, I mean, we had a big conference all over the world. People came. So Somali was leading. So we were leading that work. So mm. we featured for a, a very, That's very true. good reason. That's true. We, okay. we had due credit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Somali were the credit they deserve. Like, I think, I think, I think it is perpetrated in a negative way. I think, oh my God, oh, God, oh God, Somali was a... <laughs> It's like, no, they're speaking about something that no one else is dared to speak about. Yes. Yeah. All right, next question. Can FGM be reversed? Scar can never be reversed. I mean, there are literally yesterday I was, I was an online conference with surgeons. So there okay. is there is a movement of trying. So there are surgeons around the world who are now offering services to women. But what you could do, you can actually statically, you can make it look better. But for some women, really, everything was removed. Literally, uh, okay. like there's nothing right. left. Mm. So they can't. So they now develop these like silicone uh, uh, gels that they put in it to make it look like. I mean, I think psychologically, for some women, 
just having something that looks yes. a bit like it, it helps. But the conversation we were having yesterday at this conference, like, so we need, they, the women need emotional support because the clitoris organ is not, an, it's not just in the outside, it's actually in the inside. Yes. So that's never been taken away. So a lot, that's what we need to be taught about our bodies. Mm. So women can still enjoy sex without having any further operations because the clitoris organ is still inside. You need to be comfortable about your body. That's why therapy is so important. Having the right partner who understands what you've been through. So it's a combination of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, not just women who've undergone FGM, there's a myth that women who've undergone FGM don't enjoy sex. Women in general don't have a clue about orgasm. So that's a whole... So to the women who think just because they've un undergone FGM, they're the only ones missing out. No, it's women all over the world. This is a mystery where they're still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah. The mystery for men too. So for men too, but I think but I think that's what we need to educate ourselves yeah, on. Like, yeah. We feel like, oh my God, am I the only one? No, it's really, but again, it goes back to our education system. That has to be taught in school. You know, this is the body part. This is what happens to your parts. You know, girls, you enjoy this part of your body. Like those things has to be taught in my opinion. Mm. So um, it can't be reversed, but there are cosmetic surgeries you can, you can, that you can use. I mean, what you could do that a lot of uh, may, lots of clinics do now, they open, they open the, 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 the closed wound, okay. which you need because some women we genuinely cannot urinate. It, it takes uh, 20, 40 minutes to urinate when they have their periods. Like it's like in drips. So just reopening, it would, it would be a big help. It would, mm -hmm. you know, they won't have to deal with a lot of that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I have no idea. There's some serious, serious uh, physical for... damage. Yeah. yeah. How does a person with FGM achieve an orgasm? Achieve an orgasm? Like I said, orgasm, it's really as a mental state of mind. Okay. And it's about, and, and women, really, if you want to experience an orgasm, you have to like your body. If you don't like your body, you're never going to experience orgasm. Like, there's, there's no such thing. Oh. Actually, in our clinic, what we now do, we partnered with a company called Coco de Mer, who do, who, who, they're big on like uh, women's lingeries and, and they run workshops on female pleasure. Okay. So they now, interesting session for Molly women. Taking those classes. The Molly women were learning about female pleasure. Listen, okay. it's their right. Yes, to learn about it. yes, yes. It's their right. Yes. So they were learning actually, you know, atmosphere, you know, how you, it's, there's a preparation that goes into it. It doesn't, <laughs> yeah. doesn't, doesn't happen. I think there's like, we need, I think like, people have been watching too much porn that's not what happens in real life let's really get to the chase yeah. okay that's not what happens in real life yeah. it's really about being confident about it. And, and i think with your partner you know the more it's something that you could take it you could turn it into a homework where you can actually go and learn together yes. and learn about it yes. because I, everybody is like the blind leading the blind most of the time in in, in, <laughs> in these situations yeah. and that's not what you want but actually educate yourself. So now in our clinic, we actually educate women about what female pleasure is, you know, their sensitive parts, you know, what are the indigenous zones that they should yeah. you know, get their partner to focus on. Um, so that's very important, like really, like it is, an orgasm is a, a, a atmosphere that you create for yourself, you know, yes. if you have okay. the right lighting and candles yes. and scent, that's, you know, really settles you in. Gotcha. Um, so it's, 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 but it's something that we all have to learn. Like no one, I, I, this is, listen, if I was a president of this country, I'll be changing the school curriculum. And this would be one of the key <laughs> yeah. uh, learnings. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are angry and pissed off. They yeah. just, they're just not having orgasms. I think if people had more orgasms, they'd be much happier and, so, and, and nicer people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you had the procedure and you've never experienced it, don't worry about it. It's it has it. yeah, but it has nothing to do with the per, FGM procedure. No, no, no. Go to therapy. Mm -hmm. Reason the re, the only connection to FGM is is the trauma they experience. Yes, yes. Something really bad happened to that part of your body. You know, mm -hmm. your genitalia was you know traumatized. Yeah. So you yeah. need to go and talk about it. So therapy is a big part of really, and therapy means you're gonna like it because you hate your body when you go through something like that. You mm -hmm. really are. Your body becomes your enemy. Yes. So you need to be in a space where you can actually be friend, be friendly and love your body again. I think, and that's slowly. How you um, has there been progress in decreasing the practice in certain hotspots in Africa? Listen, in Africa right now, I've been work. I've been going back since 2013. I think 
it's about seven years, over seven years. And if we talk about Africa in general, yeah, Kenya, definitely. Kenya, Ghana, West Africa, you can see a decrease happening. I mean, not places like Gambia, still very high. Guinea is still very high. Somalia has been quite interesting. Somalia has been one of the highest. Like we were 99 something at one point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think now we've come down to 90, 92, 98, something like that. It keeps changing, but it's, it's still one of the highest. Still one of the highest. And one of the most funded, I guess, anytime anyone's working on an FGM project, they're in Somalia. And actually, literally, currently, I'm having a conversation with a couple of researchers. Like, really, we want to understand why so many programs, but nothing's really gone down. So, my theory is that. We've gone from type three to type one. Oh, okay. So it's going from the worst severe type. Yes. Because then we can't say we've ended FGM because the way sometimes these things are reported that we end, I'm like, no, 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 no. We need to really question that. They haven't ended FGM. They just went from one type to another type. Mm -hmm. And people will say to me, you know, there's always that argument, oh, you know, let's just do the little one. For me, it's like, why do we have to do anything to a girl? Like that's, let's have that conversation. True. Why? Why do I, as a parent, why am I already having this assumption about my own child that she's going to be doing these terrible things? Yes. That I must physically harm her to ensure. I mean, what kind of message am I saying to my child by doing that? Mm -hmm. One, I'm telling her I don't trust her and she's only like five. Like, <laughs> you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. Those messages really has an impact on you. True, it yeah. really does. Um, so my thing is, it doesn't matter which type grabbing a child pinning them to a table like and this child's screaming they were they're not they're not cut yet they're mm -hmm. screaming we're spreading their legs apart and there's you know they're putting cloth into their mouth wow. that's 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 a really violation to me Archer. that that itself will give them ptsd for the rest of their lives yeah so the fact that we focus on different types of cutting so i guess that's what keeps happening so there is I mean, we're going to, we are learning. We are really seeing what's in Kenya. What's happened is the women, there's a big women's movement happening in Kenya and there's a youth movement happening in Kenya. So men and women saying, this is not going to happen to any of our children. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. And actually what I really love about Kenya is like <laughs> the West is not going to tell us how to, how to end FGM. We're doing it ourselves. Why yeah. do we have other people? Because you know, I'm from the West. Yes. I hold that yeah. position. So, and I, I, and I love that I really, like I'm telling us in the West, we need to learn how Kenya's really doing this. Like literally we need to, and it's because there's a big youth movement that's happening in Kenya. Somali, we're gonna see a big shift when the young people, boys and girls really come together and say, no more. Because in Somalia, as you can see, we're having this, I mean, we're having a pandemic of rape in Somalia right now. Yes. It's really, it's bad. And, and what shocks bad. me every time I hear those cases, girls are actually closed. So the girls are being raped are totally closed. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine, like, you can't even imagine. You guys can't even imagine that. Wow. When you're closed like that and you've been raped multiple times and thrown in the water. I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine that. So, so Somalia needs to have a very strong youth movement that needs to take over because that's, what, that's what's worked in Kenya and that's what's worked in other Western African countries. But historically, look at any civil rights movement, any movement, who led it when it made change happen? It was young people. Young people, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So Somalia, we don't need an anti-FGM movement. We need a youth movement that says enough is enough. You know, none of our mm -hmm. young children are going to be violated in, in, in such a way. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just dealing with FGM. You know, we are raping. We are, girls are being given as gifts to six year old men when she's nine. That's abuse. You know, we have to call it that. Yes. So that has to, to me, that's when we're going to start seeing change. In your opinion, who is um, still holding on to the, the procedure, the tradition? Is it women or is it the men that are really pushing the FGM is still in 2020? Um, do you know who's holding on to it more? The diasporas, which is interesting. Really? Yeah. But this is very common behavior. By the way, you know, I, you know, as a therapist, I study human behavior. <laughs> it's a very interesting migrant story. 
Wow. You will find this with Pakistanis, Indians, you know, other, any, any community that's migrated to a Western society. Yeah. We feel we need to hold on to things that we never used to. Have. I mean, do you remember Burjuko that they used yeah. to cook the food in, right? Yes. That was yes. in Somalia. That was in the kitchen, thrown in the corner somewhere. No one cared. Yes. We came to England where I live in London. It's like the mantelpiece in the house now. Like we worship the Burjuko. Uh, yeah. Why? There's a fear of losing our identity. Hence mm. why diasporas hold on to it. What I found really interesting, I haven't been back to Somalia, but I've been going to Kenya quite often. There's a big Somali community there. The Somali community have kind of left these, these traditions behind. <laughs> They're like, why are you still so <laughs> arguing about this? Yeah. Like, you know, like in, in the West, there's a segregation. You know, Nimanka eat on this side, the women eat on this yeah. side. Yeah. Happening in London and Toronto. Yes. If you go to Nairobi, that's not what's happening. The Somalian women are sitting together mm. in their lives together. So it's really interesting how, so in terms of your question, who's holding on to it more? I, from my experience, it's the diasporas who hold on to this stuff more than people back home. It's, we don't want to lose our identity. There's a fear in the diaspora. We are fearful that we're going to lose our culture, but that's not, we can't lose, we will never lose our culture. As you know, if we are taught to be proud, I'm a very proud Somali. Oh my God, like any event or platform I'm at, you see the dirac coming out first. Like that is a household I was brought up yes. in. Yes. But I will not stand for a practice that harms people. That's not my tradition. I refuse. Whenever people say to me, you know, you Somalis have this culture. I go, you know what? I'm going to stop saying that. This is not Somali culture, okay? Let's stop using it. This is mm -hmm. violence. That That's absolutely, I'm not taking this on as my culture. My culture is good food. The dira and the music. <laughs> yes. Done. So our last question is, what are some of the ways to stop the stigma of FGM? A show shows like yours, having these conversations, you know, the mm. the the taking the myths away. You yeah. know, hopefully by the time your audience listens to this, they realize FGM is not a Somali issue <laughs> only. Yes. It's about patriarchy. And patriarchy is everywhere. Literally your white friends live under a patriarchal system. So yeah. Educating yourself, getting the right information is how you de de destigmatize um, FGM, but also recognizing the damage it does to our girls. What use, why are we protecting something that's so violating? We really need to ask ourselves that question. Why? If we're such good Somalis, you know, we have, we, we know, we, we, I, we, I love this word. I'm like, that's nice. But why are people so damaged? Yes. <laughs> why are we torturing people? Mm -hmm. I would say these things, right? Yes. So for me, we need to, uh, for me, the, the best way of dealing with it, let's start creating more spaces, safe space where we can continue. Have, this conversation needs to continue. Yeah, to continue. just talking about I really it. Hope, and I really hope you have platforms where men really talk about masculinity. What does it mean to be a masculine? Yes. Being violent or being, like I've seen uh, when men, Somali men are being loving husbands or good dads they're teased about it i've seen them being teased mm -hmm. so we really need to yeah. so it's, but you see all these things are connected mm -hmm. fgm happens because for my future husband but my future husband is this guy who's you know going to use his microaggression masculinity against me it's like it's all yeah. toxic yeah, so it's yeah, all right. very much connected so we need to have these conversations all in one place so I definitely encourage more conversations, more safe spaces, you know, where we're not shouting and screaming at each other because yeah, that's exactly. not going to work. Yeah. But really educate yourself. Go and find out about this information. And FGM is not a Somali issue. It's a global issue. I mean, in the UK, I'm challenging practitioners. You know, they have something called, in the West, they have something called labioplasty for white women. <laughs> okay. It's FGM. I blatantly say it's FGM. Oh, wow. Why, why is it FGM when I do it? And when a white woman does it, no, it's her choice. Gotcha. You have to, so I'm, I'm in a position to, to be challenging that too. You yeah. can't say one group is barbaric and the other one is a choice. Yes. Race is a big issue here as well. So we need to. Ah, oh, do you talk about it? So do you see, you have to come in from a low, from different yes. angles. No, thank you so much, Leila, Dr. Leila Hussein, for taking the time to educate us. I thank had no me. idea. I've learned so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. The more we talk about it, the easier it becomes. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Leila. Thank you. Right. Bye.